the iron grip of the Third Reich was spiraling toward a catastrophic finale. Deep beneath the Reich Chancellery, in a dimly lit bunker, a frantic Adolf Hitler, his eyes wild with desperation, was cornered. Outside, the relentless advance of the Red Army was closing in, ready to extinguish the so-called Thousand-Year Reich. Defiant to the bitter end, Hitler clung to any fragment of hopeful news, praying for a miracle to wrench Germany from the jaws of obliteration. Above ground, Berlin was a city under siege. The skies roared with the constant thunder of bombing runs, tearing the streets to shreds. The citizens, wrapped in a cloak of crippling fear, huddled wherever they could find refuge, bracing for the Soviet onslaught and dreading the horrors that awaited them under their new captors. The city was choked by ash, smoke and relentless fires. Despair hung heavy in the air, yet, out of the gloom, a sudden spark of hope ignited. Radios and loudspeakers crackled to life, broadcasting a staggering claim, a miracle was on the horizon. The German 12th Army, which had been staving off US forces, was reportedly marching to shatter the Soviet stranglehold and rescue the city. In an even more shocking turn, rumors flew that the United States had flipped sides, now joining the Germans in a desperate stand against the merciless Red Army. Yet few gave credence to the desperate bluster of Hitler's propaganda machine. General Walter Wenck, the Wehrmacht's youngest general and commander of the 12th Army, had received orders to disengage from the Americans and attempt the impossible, break the siege of Berlin at all costs, in a daring gambit to either regroup or negotiate peace. But in a defiant twist that pushed Hitler to the edge of insanity, Wenck marshaled his troops and prepared to commit the unthinkable, defy Hitler himself. Rallying his men, he proclaimed, quote, Comrades, you've got to go in once more. It's not about Berlin anymore. It's not about the Reich anymore. Today's action-packed story of the dramatic final days of the war in Europe is sponsored by War Thunder, the most comprehensive vehicle combat game available for free on PC and consoles. Dive into battles with over 2,500 tanks, planes, helicopters and ships. From the roaring biplanes of the 1920s to today's thundering fighter jets and main battle tanks, experience warfare across 10 major nations. With War Thunder's incredibly detailed vehicles and realistic graphics, you can feel the intensity of the battlefield firsthand, placing you at the helm of the most powerful war machines of our time. In it, every battle is a story of precision and tactics, thanks to one of the most sophisticated damage models in gaming. War Thunder doesn't just show damage, it shows you how and why each vehicle component reacting just as it would in the real world. Whether you're into fast-paced battles, seeking authenticity, or ready for the ultimate test, War Thunder has something for everyone. Customize your machines with an array of camouflages, markings, and decorations, and the best part, you don't need extra hardware. Dive into any battle using just your mouse and keyboard, or a controller. Here at World War II TV, we appreciate War Thunder's immense scale and interactions between air, ground and naval forces. The attention to detail truly makes each battle epic, just like the ones in our videos. Join War Thunder for free on PC, PlayStation or Xbox by clicking on the link in the description. New and returning players who haven't been in the skies or on the battlefield for at least six months get a massive bonus pack including premium vehicles, the exclusive vehicle decorator Eagle of Valor, 100,000 Silver Lions, and seven days of premium account. But hurry, it's available for a limited time. Don't miss out on this thrilling experience. War Thunder awaits you, Commander. Join the battle today. Allied leaders had been certain for months, if not years, that Germany's defeat was only a matter of time. As 1945 dawned, even most German officers were coming to grips with the reality that they were embroiled in a losing battle. Yet Hitler and many top brass in the German high command stubbornly held onto the belief that they could still pull a rabbit out of the hat and turn their spiraling defeat into a stunning comeback, pinning their hopes on game-changing wonder weapons, striking a deal with the Americans or the Soviets turning tail before reaching Berlin were some of the desperate cards Hitler hoped would reshuffle the deck in their favor. On April 12th, Hitler experienced what might have been one of his final surges of adrenaline when he received news of the passing of the President of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt. He ranted wildly, proclaiming this as the miracle Germany had been waiting for, convinced that now President Truman would surely strike a peace deal with the Third Reich. 
However, the United States had no interest in cutting a deal with the dictator. No silver bullet appeared to salvage Germany's fate. Hitler's mental and physical health deteriorated, just as the Red Army and the Western Allies relentlessly marched closer to Berlin. On April 16, 1945, the Red Army unleashed its full might on the German capital, mobilizing over 20 armies, 2.5 million soldiers, and 40,000 mortars and field guns in a devastating assault. On April 20th, Adolf Hitler commemorated what would be his final birthday within the grim, echoic confines of his bunker, a bleak ceremony starkly stripped of any former grandeur. The bunker, 50 feet below the battered streets of Berlin, was suffused with a heavy, oppressive air, casting a shadow over the handful of attendees. These guests, more prisoners of circumstance than willing participants, shuffled uncomfortably, their faces etched with fatigue and desperation. Each was acutely aware of the relentless Allied advance, their minds on the rapidly closing escape routes from the besieged city. Hitler, a gaunt figure hollowed out by stress and defeat, attempted to muster his usual commanding presence. His voice, once capable of stirring fervent rallies, now barely rose above a hoarse whisper as he uttered a feeble, quote, Heil Juch. The response was a murmur, almost lost amid the distant but ever-present thunder of Soviet artillery. The strained smiles and hurried well-wishes did little to mask the palpable sense of doom hanging over the gathering. As the ceremony concluded, the attendees dispersed quickly, eager to disappear into the shadows of the bunker's cold, concrete corridors, each step echoing their looming defeat. Just when he needed them most, his generals let down the Führer. The armies began to fracture and retreat. On the 22nd, Heinrich Himmler attempted to negotiate Germany's surrender terms with the Western Allies. The following day, Hermann Göring, the chief of the Luftwaffe, fired off a telegram to Hitler, proposing to take over the reins of Germany. Quote, If no reply is received by 10 o'clock tonight, I shall take it for granted that you have lost your freedom of action. Enraged, Hitler accused his generals of high treason, ordering their arrest on the spot. In a blistering outburst, Hitler commanded the arrest of Karl Wilding, a Panzer Corps commander, accusing him of deserting his post. Yet Wilding was still battling on the outskirts of Berlin. After proving his loyalty to the dictator, Wilding was named the Battle Commandant of Berlin. However, Wilding's prospects of holding the city were slim, and Hitler clung to the hope that the German army could punch through the siege. He ordered Waffen-SS senior group leader Felix Steiner to launch an assault on the forces of Soviet Marshal Georgi Zhukov's first Belarusian front, which were tightening their grip around Berlin from the north, while Soviet Marshal Ivan Konev's first Ukrainian front encroached from the south. Steiner's mission was to disrupt Zhukov and stem the Soviet tide surging toward the capital. Yet, facing a shortage of functional tanks and a significant gap in infantry numbers, Steiner chose to retreat instead. With Steiner's pullback, all eyes turned to Germany's 12th Army, commanded by 45-year-old General Walter Wenck, Hitler's last glimmer of hope to salvage Berlin. Wenck, dubbed the boy general and the youngest general in the Wehrmacht, had just been appointed to lead the 12th Army. Ordered to pull back from combat against the Americans, he raced eastward to Berlin's aid. Wenck was tasked with linking up with the remnants of the 9th Army under General of the Infantry Theodor Busser. Their combined forces were to strike the Soviets encircling Berlin from the west and south. This maneuver was Hitler's final gambit to delay the fall of Berlin. The boy general's career soared meteorically during the harrowing years of World War II. His earlier claim was sealed during the invasion of Poland, where amid the turmoil and bloodshed, Wenck clinched the Iron Cross of the second class. Quickly followed by the first class, he emerged as a born leader, pushing his men to exceed their duties with his own brand of gritty inspiration. His tactical acumen shone during the rapid conquest of Belfort in 1940, earning him a promotion to colonel and bolstering his standing as a remarkable strategist, despite his youth relative to other officers. Throughout the fierce offensives across Belgium, Luxembourg, France and the Netherlands, Wenck's bravery and tenacity were unmistakable. Leading from the front lines, he sustained a severe leg wound. Despite having every justification to pull back for medical treatment, Wenck chose to remain with his troops, commanding with relentless vigor. This defiant resilience only heightened his esteem among his men. 
By late 1942, Wenck's military trajectory hit a new zenith with the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross and his elevation to Major General. His leadership prowess and battlefield efficacy were beyond question. Yet, as 1945 dawned, the shadows of war lengthened and the situation grew increasingly dire. Under Heinz Guderian's direction, Wenck took charge of the forces in Operation Solstice, a desperate bid by the Third Reich to regain initiative on the Eastern Front. Conceived as a bold strike to free Kustrin and stave off the encircling Soviet troops, the operation was plagued by superior Soviet intelligence, insufficient prep time and rushed execution leading to a debilitating German setback. Despite his illustrious career and sterling reputation, the boy general was outmatched as the Allies tightened their grip on Berlin. Confronted with Hitler's order to break the siege, a wildly unrealistic command as the Third Reich disintegrated, Wenck stood at a crossroads. He had to choose between obeying a delusional leader or carving his own path through the ruins and mayhem of a collapsing regime. Wenck's mission teetered on the brink of impossibility from the get-go. He led the last German army still in fighting trim, yet the spectre of doom loomed large as Berlin was mercilessly squeezed by no fewer than 20 Soviet field armies. Even if he managed to carve through the siege lines and reach the Reich Chancellery, the Soviets, relentless and overwhelming, would swiftly regroup and smother the city once again under a new wave of encirclement. Nevertheless, the boy general pushed forward toward Berlin. Despite their determined advance, the 12th Army collided with a wall of Soviet resistance near Potsdam. The air was thick with the smell of gunpowder, and the earth shook under the relentless artillery barrage. Meanwhile, the beleaguered remnants of the 9th Army faltered, failing to rendezvous with Wenck. By April 27th, the iron circle of Soviet forces clamped shut, sealing off any escape from the rubble-strewn smoldering ruin of the capital. A day later, Wenck bleakly reported to the German Supreme Army Command that his 12th Army had been battered and pushed back, and any offensive toward Berlin was now a lost cause. He also confirmed the grim reality that no support from the 9th Army was coming and that external relief for the city was a fantasy. Yet the orders were stark and uncompromising. He was to attempt to breach the siege at all costs. Field Marshal Keitel, after a daring escape from Hitler's bunker, met with Wenck outside the city. Amidst the chaos of war, Keitel impressed upon Wenck the desperate, albeit futile, need for the 12th Army to break the siege and rescue Hitler. Distrusting even Field Marshal Keitel to relay his commands without dilution, Hitler commanded his orders to be broadcast across every available radio station in a desperate and unprecedented public plea for military obedience. He did not care if the Allies heard them, this was an all-or-nothing moment. Ultimately, Wenck decided to advance toward Berlin, but not to save Hitler. As the reality of their dire situation sank in, Wenck confronted three harrowing choices, break away and head for the Western Front as other generals had, blindly sacrifice his army for a cause already lost for a crumbling regime, or defy the Führer and forge a path that could offer a semblance of hope to his beleaguered men. At this point, the soldiers of the 12th Army were acutely aware that the end was near. Many were desperate to surrender to the Western Allies. They knew the war was over and harbored a deep fear of the Red Army's retribution. The Soviets, notorious for their lack of mercy since their victory at Stalingrad, had swept through German territories with a vengeance, marked by ruthless executions, tortures and a plethora of atrocities against the faltering German forces and civilians alike. With any notion of victory abandoned, the only glimmer of hope for both German servicemen and civilians was to fall into the hands of the Western Allies rather than suffer under Soviet capture. So when Wenck rallied his troops for one final mission, many responded with trepidation and a deep-seated desire to head west. Yet Wenck, undeterred and resolute, managed to transform their doubts into a semblance of bravery persuading them that their efforts could prevent countless Germans from the grim fate awaiting them under Soviet control. The 12th Army made a daring push south of Bielitz to aid the battered 9th Army. Together, they crafted a plan to carve out a humanitarian corridor, 
a lifeline for Germans trapped in the city to escape westward. Unaware of Wenck's true intentions, Keitel relayed to Hitler that the 12th Army was on the move, sparking a fleeting surge of optimism in the Führer, who clung to the hope of Wenck breaking through the Soviet encirclement. But the rescue mission was doomed to remain a fantasy. Despite Germany's relentless radio broadcasts proclaiming that the 12th Army was en route to liberate Berlin and that the Americans had shifted their allegiance to fight alongside Germany against the Red Army, these were nothing but desperate propaganda. The Soviet flag would soon flutter from the Reich Chancellery, signalling the definitive end. Amidst this grim scenario, Wenck and his army were portrayed as the last beacon of hope for the Third Reich and its delusional leader, a role crafted more from desperation than any semblance of potential success. General Walter Wenck was deeply entrenched in humanitarian efforts long before the final days of Berlin's siege. His 12th Army had been a lifeline for German refugees fleeing towards Berlin, reportedly providing sustenance to around a quarter of a million people daily. In addition to supplying food, Wenck facilitated the westward movement of refugees from camps to the west of Berlin, steering them toward the safety of the American lines. His profound empathy for the plight of German civilians, coupled with his understanding of the terror wrought by the prospect of Soviet captivity, fortified his resolve to undertake a massive rescue operation. As April waned and the Red Army tightened its grip on the German capital, Wenck seized the chaotic momentum of their advance. He strategically opened a corridor through the dense forest of Halbe, utilizing the disarray to carve a path of escape for thousands. Through the valiant efforts of the 12th Army, a lifeline emerged. Wenck orchestrated a daring exodus, enabling thousands of Berliners and weary soldiers to flee the combat and chaos. Estimates vary, but Wenck's operation successfully evacuated tens, if not hundreds, of thousands of civilians, guiding them safely across the Elbe River, where they could find refuge. Wenck's mission was significantly bolstered by the cooperation of American General William Hood Simpson, who extended crucial support to the throngs of refugees and deserters seeking sanctuary. This collaboration underscored a rare instance of Allied aid, facilitating a German commander's humanitarian efforts during these final convulsive days of the war. General Wenck remained steadfast in his mission until the very end, being the last member of the 12th Army to cross the Elbe River and surrender to the Americans on May 7th. His courageous and compassionate actions during the war's harrowing conclusion earned him accolades from both the Allies and his fellow Germans. As the Red Army tightened its noose around the Führerbunker, Adolf Hitler faced the inevitable with only blocks separating him from his enemies. In a last act of desperate humanity, he married Eva Braun on April 29th. Cementing their long-standing relationship, they both took their own lives a day later. Within days on May 5th, the grim aftermath unfolded as Soviet soldiers led by Lieutenant Alexei Panasov discovered the remains of Hitler and his wife, Hastily concealed near the bunker, the news ricocheted across the globe. Marshal Georgi Zhukov, who commanded the Red Army's advance, reported that upon hearing of Hitler's demise, Joseph Stalin expressed regret, stating, quote, It's a pity we didn't manage to take him alive. World War II TV gives a hearty salute to War Thunder for sponsoring today's video. Remember, you can play for free on PC, PlayStation or Xbox now, by using the link in our video description. New and returning players that haven't played in six months will be able to get their hands on a massive bonus pack, but it's available for a limited time, so don't miss out.